So thank you so much, Jane, for that introduction. It is just a delight to be here. And I just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak uh, today. As you say, you know, my 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 journey uh, into this has been uh, has been somewhat of a journey, and uh, and really, you know, I got into the open movement because of my work on copyright reform in the European Parliament. I think Matt, you you described it. You'd heard me speak when I was an MEP about the trials and tribulations of European Union copyright reform, but it was really that experience, the disparity I saw of the huge lobby on one side of publishers and the music industry and the real absence of a voice from civil society. And I'm here in my little study today in Dunfermline. And Dunfermline is the home of the very first uh, Carnegie Library. And above every Carnegie Library, there's the words of let there be not, let, let, let there be light, not just the light of knowledge, but the light of public spaces. And somehow I think, um, you know, sitting here running um, Creative Commons now and just to share with you <laughs> that um, I was recruited, to, but this time last year I was going through the recruitment process. I've never met my team. I've never met my board. Um, I've worked completely remotely and distributed as we all do just now. Um, so I have to be honest with you, I'm really excited about getting that vaccine and being able to meet people in person for the very first time. So that's something that I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to. But, um, you know, running this global not for profit that is spread across the US, Canada, um, we have a network of 48 uh, chapters globally, running that team um, across all these different uh, places is just such a privilege. But one of the things I wanted to first, you know, kind of share the theme, why I've chosen better sharing is because one of the first actions um, I took as the new CEO of Creative Commons was an intensive four month process of really, uh, really thinking strategically and creating a new strategy for the next five years. And so we had an intensive four month process of talking to stakeholders, talking to our funders, our community, the board, the team uh, supporters. And we published in December our new strategy where the central theme is better sharing. So what I thought, and that's why um, I, I, I uh, took the theme of my talk today to be better open sharing, because that is the theme of our new strategy and where we want to be over the next five years. And if 2020 has taught us anything, there are still too many barriers to openness and that there's an urgent need to create equity and access to knowledge across the internet so that we can share and work together to face the challenges of today and those of tomorrow. So at CC, we want to explore what better open sharing looks like. How do we best serve the public and how do we do this? So what I thought I would do today is talk a little about Creative Commons, who we are, what we do, why we do it, touch on three strands, which I thought were particularly interesting, particularly as we've all faced the pandemic together in a lot of ways, climate and AI, and then to talk more about better open sharing. So if I go to my next slide about what is Creative Commons? Who are we? We're an international nonprofit dedicated to building a thriving commons of knowledge and culture. And what we do and why we do it, well, we created these legal tools, which are licenses, to be able to open up culture and knowledge and content for everyone everywhere. And we created a globally recognised alternative to the model of all rights reserved copyright. And why is open sharing important? I just think it's quite important to remind ourselves why. Open sharing advances the universal access to knowledge and cultures I just touched upon. Open sharing in the public interest fosters creativity, innovation and collaboration. And open sharing is in itself an act of solidarity. But reflecting on the fact that this is our 20 year anniversary. And you know when we think about that, that, that challenge that was faced 20 years ago, where the founders of CC were really grappling with an, a failed all rights reserved copyright. And they tried to do what, uh, for culture, what the GPL did for software. The licenses were not forced on a creator, but was a choice. And the author was choosing what to share and in what terms. And so with the licenses, the CC licenses and tools, we created a simple means for creators to opt into a more permissive model of sharing. And that's something which is really to be celebrated because if we reflect on what we have achieved in the past 20 years, and yes, I only joined in August last year, 
but important to reflect about what we've achieved that today 2 billion pieces of content are accessed across the globe through CC licenses. So what started with a vision of Larry Lessig, Hal Abelson, Jamie Boyles and others and now grown to 48 chapters with a community in over 80 countries. So CC has become this global standard of content sharing. So if we think about that, and I'll go into the, the, these three years in a second, what our current work really will focus on is in three key areas. Not I'm talking about domain jet, but about the three areas where we think we can make the difference. And that's in advocacy, reshaping the open ecosystem. It's an in innovation, enhancing the open infrastructure. Not only are we the stewards of our licenses, the tools which we have to foster, but we have which we, we foster sharing with, but we want to look at sustainable and ethical sharing in the public interest to build on what we've achieved in the past 20 years. And also we want to um, capacity build, so transform institutions to make knowledge and culture, heritage assets as openly accessible as possible through our work with GLAM and educational institutes. And this is so important as I've described on why open sharing matters. But my goodness, did we not, you know, if we'd met, you know, a year, well, gosh, a year and a half ago, we would never have thought we'd be in the situation we've just all experienced of, uh, of COVID. So I want to take a moment to think a little bit about what COVID has taught us, and we'll go into climate AI in a second. But if anything has taught us about the importance of sharing, um, of sharing knowledge, it's been the global pandemic and the challenges which we have lived through and continue to live through today. If we take equity and open education to begin with, the global health crisis has crystallised the need for policies that support uni universal access to learning resources. After the pandemic hit, the vast majority of the world's learners found themselves out of school and, or, or, and learning online. So open educational resources continue to be critical in providing easily accessible, high quality learning materials to learners of all types during this challenging time. And as learners begin to return to pre-COVID educational environments, I believe there's an incredible opportunity for us to leverage this increased awareness of it and experience with open education resources that came out of last year. So I'm really excited that Creative Commons has been really pivotal to the work of UNESCO's recommendation on open education resources to increase the adoption of open, edu open education content and practices and policies around the world. However, our ambition does not just rest in open education. We also want to work with GLAM institutions, that's galleries, libraries, archives and museums, to open up collections just as we've done most recently with the Smithsonian. So open education and open GLAM are two domain areas where CC works where we want more open sharing, but we want to do it better with more people understanding our work and more people participating in creating better conditions for knowledge and information to be shared. Yet we know so much more has to be done. CC during the pandemic helped create the Open COVID Pledge, now stewarded by the American University in Washington DC. And we need more organisations to free up their IP. And nothing better illustrates that than the challenges we've currently seen around vaccine access. I mean, it's really, this week I was really pleased that both my parents got their, their, their second vaccine. And, um, and, and that's just such a relief. And I know my, my friends who are in England, who are the same age as me, are now on the list to get their vaccine. And I know in the US just last week that uh, vaccinations were open to over 16s, not 60s, but 16s. And so my US team now, you know, are, 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 are almost fully vaccinated. But then I speak to my chapters in Africa and know that, um, you know, it's grim about the situation there. So when I see how close we were to having um, open vaccines so that everyone could benefit from that knowledge, it's just really critical that we learn that this is not acceptable. And that's why open IP and vaccine access is critical to creating a more equal world. If ever there was a need to share better, then I think this is a case in point. But moving to climate, the reason I wanted to touch on this, I mean, I guess I'm a little bit biased living in Scotland because COP26, as many of you know, is set to, to be held 
in Glasgow. Now, we don't know yet whether that will be physically or virtually, but climate change is the signature crisis of our time. And it could not be more clear that legal barriers to data research and IP that could be used openly by innovators in the fight against climate change and, and, and could, be, um, could be used openly and eliminated. So in short, similarly to the vaccine debacle, IP law that restricts access to knowledge should not keep us from being able to win this important fight on climate change. So we need to open up IP. And with COP fast approaching, we are reflecting the better sharing in our work on climate could leverage Creative Commons expertise and expand our proven approach in developing new methods and tools where that would be legal or technical and social to enable an interoperable layer of scientific research, data and IP that, be, that could be used in the fight against climate change. These open science tools and works that are available are only useful if they're discoverable, technically accessible and translated into multiple languages, well organised and presented in a clear and thoughtful manner. So as we reflect on the past for Creative Commons and we think about the future of what we would like to think is better sharing, we believe that climate has to be part of our thinking. And then turning just very briefly to AI. I mean, if I again reflect on my work in copyright, when I was working on copyright reform in the European Parliament just seven years ago, we were talking, as many of you do, about text and data mining. The right to read is the right to mine. And any copyright debate today would be focused instead, I believe, on machine learning, which, as you know, is a subset of AI. Because where text and data mining is reading, the subset of AI in terms of machine le learning is not just reading, but in its name, but learning. And it's interesting today that today marks the official publication of the EU's AI draft legislative proposal. So decisions made there will have global, global implications because they will set the standards and norms for those wanting accountability and transparency in terms of AI. Now, I read in the, the Observer the weekend uh, on Sunday that, you know, that, that it, was a, it was an academic who described AI as like how we should think about it as a pet. And I, I tend to think it's, it's, it's much more complicated than that, that it's both got the potential for good and the potential for great harm. But according to James Grimmelman, if you count by the total number of words read, robotic reading is now overwhelmingly more common than human. And as Mark Lemley and Brian Casey note in a recent um, public in a recent article, today, some, some 30 years after the rise of the robotic reader, all signs suggest another paradigm shift. This time with a new class of robotic robotic technologies that's less focused on passively reading, reading information than on actively learning from it. We're moving from robotic readers to robotic learners. And we will need new York norms and standards if we are going to deal with this. And therefore, when it comes to copyright and comes from design, we need to think more actively about the rules and regulations that apply. Now, moving to thinking more about better open sharing, there's somewhat of a paradox. And I keep on reflecting about proprietary systems and generative systems and thinking about how at one level, you know, Creative Commons is clearly in the generative and supporting generative norms. But when you think at the moment about how so many of us just actively share on proprietary platforms, which is nothing about sharing and all about selling, there is something quite, you know, needs to be explored about how we even, I keep on thinking that it's not sharing in the sense of you and I might think about sharing, but it's more showing and telling about some of the ways that we, act, we, we think we are sharing online. But going back to the importance of generative systems is going to be an important part of how we think about talking more about better open sharing. And, you know, and as we think about the licensed stewardship that is at the heart of what Creative Commons does, we have that real responsibility to ensure that the licenses are both fit for purpose, technically up to date, but also in terms of how they are translated across the world and accessible to more and more people. But there's something as well about how we look at the public domain. 
And there's lots of different conversations going on at the moment about the importance of the commons, uh, the, uh, not, not the, both the physical and virtual commons with climate and what we're facing today with the, the, the discussions around the internet and the open internet. But there is an element of how are we going to, as Ron Dalbert said about resetting the internet for civil society, how are we going to reboot the internet and how are we going to protect the public domain that belongs to us all. I've heard too often that content or a piece of art or whatever it is that should be in the public domain is not in the public domain for va various different reasons. And even the situation of where some things that are actually in the public domain have been trademarked and are no longer in the public domain. Now that should be an outrage to us all. And it, it's something which um, I keep coming back to a campaign for the public domain. Maybe I like the alliteration. But we have to do more to celebrate the public domain, but also make sure that we protect it. Now, we have I thought I would have a few questions, and um, I think we're going to post these in the chat. Is that right, Jane? Contribute to me, tell me what we're doing with the, the questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm here. We're all here. Brilliant. All 142 Brilliant. Of us. Isn't it funny? You've got, you know, you're, you're, you're talking to, I'm, I'm talking to this screen, and I'm like waving to Jane from my. Yeah my little attic in Dunfermline, but it's lovely that we can do this. <laughs> this is the celebration of open technology. I mean, it's wonderful, uh, but, you know. Yeah. Anyway, what does open sharing mean to you and your organisation and how could CC help? And if there's one action to create better open sharing, what would you choose? And so that was the two questions when I was talking, again, Jane and I was like thinking about a few questions before I was speaking. What, what could what could we do? And those are the two questions I thought were most appropriate. So if we put that in the chat and then do you want me to answer the, the, the answers, Jane, just now or will we wait till the end? What do you want me to do? We've only got we've got we've got uh, we've got a question for you to answer. Great. It's quite specific, but I, I wonder whether um, actually let's pick that up now. Um, Great. Uh, so Aaron's asked around Great. about open about OERs. Yes, so it's, it's, as you talked about OERs earlier on. So how can the usage of OERs in the glam sector further the agenda of open innovation within scientific community? Well, I I think you know we, we're. We are trying to develop our open GLAM program just now at Creative Commons, and a strand of that has to be about open education. So there's two parts. There's there's how you use the education piece more generally to you know allow more people to look at open collection. So that's one aspect. But there's actually um, the 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 very kind of almost taking people on that journey from close to open and how we do that. And I keep talking about this ladder of engagement that we need to have to bring people along with us. So I do think there's two ways. One is in terms of the content itself once it becomes open and how you put the education bit around that, wrap around it, but also how we do that in the first place. So, um, and, and that is, you know, that is bringing, I guess, sometimes two quite different <laughs> domains together. Um, and that's co-creating and that's collaboration, but it's certainly on our agenda and watch this space as we go on to develop our open glam work. I'm really excited about it all. Okay, thank you, Catherine. So you now have a chance to talk directly to and with Catherine. So if there's anyone who feels like they, um, go, go and be brave, uh, would like to join us, uh, either to answer one of those questions or to pose a question to Catherine. If you could just pop your hand up, pop your, it, it should say raise hand in the bottom of your screen, pop your hand up and by magic, we will bring you in. Um, I can see that Wendy White has done that. So there you go. Hi, Hi Wendy. Wendy, do you want to introduce yourself? You're on mute, Wendy. Sometimes it takes a little while, doesn't it, for people to come in. There you go. Hi, Wendy. She's on mute. Wendy, you need to take yourself off mute. Or somebody needs to take you off mute. Maybe I can do it. Oops. There you go. You should be fine now. Hey. Yeah, sorry, I was just stuck this end. Don't um, worry. Yeah, no, good to good to see everyone. I mean, I think um, just really interested in picking up on Catherine's comment she was making about co-creation, I think, which is going to be a really important way forward. Um, and in terms of the question, what does open sharing mean to you and your organisation? 
I think probably all of us in our institutional strategies have something which says something like changing the world for the better, yeah. sharing new knowledge and making a difference. Um, so I think part of it is that's all true and very laudable. And of course, um, we would all support those aims. But what does that mean in practice? Yeah. And I think that the, the key thing here is what can we do to um, alter our research practice or our educational practice that really makes a difference? And I think co-creation is one of those. I don't think we've really solved yet the balance between what you might call central services and the embedded groups of educators or researchers in terms of how they go about their practice and the balance between those. Um, so I think that that's one area for development. And the other I think is we haven't truly yet upstreamed some of the openness um, in some of our uh, processes. So for research that really needs to be um, at the point of the research question or for education at the point of the curriculum design. And I think maybe the improvements in terms of what does open sharing mean um, uh, uh, maybe slightly different. So for research, I think ethics, yeah. um, you know, if the COVID situation has taught us anything, it's that ethics is absolutely central. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, at the nub of some of the things Catherine was also mentioning about, you know, IP and, um, you know, the, the, the lack of um, appropriate resolution there. If we upstream uh, the ethics discussions more and are more engaged in those, then openness should be part of the ethics, not a separate thing. Um, uh, and the, the licensing and the sharing should also be part of that ethical concern before yeah. other things even go forward. Not at the end as an afterthought. Now we're doing the open bit, you yeah. know, right at the end. Um, and for education, I think the route in could potentially be around the diversity and inclusion yeah. discussions again, which absolutely should be up front in curriculum design or any of the kind of educational scoping. Uh, and again, the openness should be part of that discussion in terms of the inclusivity. Um, so, um, so yes, I think... Um, that's what open sharing should should be about um, and what we could aspire to improve, I think. Yeah. If you're if you're particularly interested in um, uh, open software and ethics as well, this might be of interest. One of our podcasts, we've we created a new podcast series at Creative Commons, came out in February. Um, and Cor uh, Coraline, who um, is really leading the kind of thinking around ethical software and licensing she did a brilliant podcast that might be of interest to, to some of you here today so please you know it's open minds of the creative commons podcast and we've now got um, the latest speaker actually was Leela Bailey from the internet archive and there's something that she touched upon with that Wendy which was about how are we going to archive content that is now hidden behind proprietary systems such as you know if you look at Netflix creating content and and um and Amazon Prime and all these, there's nothing in a DVD. There's nothing, it's all, you know, and, and will that go, where does that go to? So it's just, there's something about the next 20 years that, that there's ethical questions in so many different ways that are there. Anyway, I just wanted to highlight that um, podcast by Coraline. Yeah, no, that sounds interesting. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine. And I would suggest that everybody has a little look at the, 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 the Creative Commons website. I have to say it's a long time since I've got it. It's an awful lot of excellent resources on there. They're great. They're great. Um, Annette Lawrence has put something in the chat, uh, which I imagine resonates with a lot of us on this call around open sharing, what open sharing means to us. It's, it's, a, it's about access for our unique and distinctive collections, which are currently hidden in special collections departments. And there's a whole heap of questions around that, really. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, um, you know, uh, uh, around ownership yes. and, and, and the ability actually to, because there's an awful lot of hidden collections yeah. um, that we aren't able to make open. Yeah. And there's, there's, you know, there's something that we are, you know, clearly, we were created to really, you know, promote uh, open sharing, the value of open sharing, and 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 that still is our bread and butter. That is what we are about. But there are things we never thought about twenty years ago, like issues around traditional knowledge, like things around, you know, sacred, you know, things that might not be. And so there's something about, you know, our learning over the past twenty years and how we're thinking about the next, and and acknowledging some of the things which, you know, we are particularly as we're going to be expanding our, our GLAM programme to think about how we're going to address some of those issues. So watch this space. We're, we're only in our early stages, but we're going to get somewhere with it, which I think would be helpful 
um, to, to those that are thinking about what, what can be and not be yeah. uh, open when we're trying to encourage and nurture and help yeah. um, you know, organisations with collections to, to go open and be accessible. Um, so we know there's, there is a, there's a complexity there, which um, we, we are very, very um, mindful of. Yeah, yeah. I see we have someone from your neck of the woods who you might oh, know. Yes, Katie. from St Andrews. That's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> do you know, I just, did the, I just did the computer science department at lunchtime with St Andrews <laughs> talking about Creative Commons, so it's nice to see you, Kate. Yeah, so I'm Katie Eagleton. I'm the Director of Libraries and Museums at St Andrews. And I thought this was a good point to come in on something that sort of came up in a meeting I was in yesterday, which is on this point about digitising our library, yeah. archive and museum collections. My hunch is that across a lot of our sector, there's a, there's a generally good warm feeling towards open sharing, but then it hits the commercial reality of the need to generate income for institutions. And that's going to be an even bigger imperative post-COVID. So my question is, how can we get better as a sector of showing the impact and benefits of sharing beyond the potential, often relatively modest income you can get from image licensing yeah. to get past that quite narrow argument? Yeah. So I think that there's, the, well, firstly, showing who's doing it successfully and how it works. So sharing best practice and why that. Also, you know, it's interesting you say about it because I was talking to, to someone yesterday about it and, and thinking particularly those organisations in the Global South, very small or, you know, who, who might not have opportunity. So how can we, you know, show that this is possible? Because you know, having an audience of the world for things that are in your collections that are meaningful, add and build on knowledge because no knowledge comes out of other, knowledge is built on knowledge and we all, we all, we all you know, you know, go, was it sit on the shoulders of giants because, you know, the, the, the nature of how we create and, and back to it, co-create things. So I think there's shared, sharing best practice, showing how, how it's done and done effectively and, and moving away slightly from you know, some of that commercial argument to saying about the public argument and the public interest and how actually it will benefit you more if you do that, not less. So, um, so there's just so many arguments, Katie, and I'll, I'll come back to you at some point. <laughs> um, yes, with, uh, with, with some more of that. But um, we are I mean, we're actually really thinking a lot about that. These are the arguments that that anybody that's working and opening up collections and thinking about how you're doing it, resources are key, right? So how are we going to do that more effectively? How do we make it more cost effective? How do we make it easier? Because applying licenses and attribution can be tricky, you know, uh, very tricky. So how can we make that easier, those processes? And, and so there's lots of thinking, but only by working together will we be able to do that and just think what we could do together. Just these people, I mean, I'm looking at how many people are on this call and just thinking if we all did some of this together, my goodness, what, 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 uh, what openness we could create together, what knowledge and what new knowledge would we be opening to the world by just opening certain collections that are just pivotal to, to build on and innovate with. It's just tremendous. Yeah, I totally agree. I think, in a way, though, there's there's a fundamental starting point, which is about trying to persuade people to get beyond the finance only bottom line, yeah. which is where we have to work together, because otherwise it will come down to yes. that income line. And, and that's really to be hard. honest, I mean, higher education under COVID, it's been mm. a challenge, yeah. not just a challenge. It has been for, <laughs> I mean, it's turned on this. And, and I just I pay tribute to all of you who who work you know, in universities, who have just gone above and beyond. What a year, a year unlike any other. And, and, you know, and now we're slightly coming out of this, right? So, you know, and uh, you know, it, it's, I think if ever there's an argument to be made about better sharing and openness, then maybe now is the time to do that. But it takes a culture change and, it, and it's more a culture change often than the resources itself. <laughs> so. Okay. Thank you. Nice to see you, Katie. Um, so we've got Bertha now, who's just put a comment about um, the sound being bad, but maybe maybe we'll be okay. I can I can certainly hear you. Hi, Do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, we can just 
just about here. You want yeah. to have a go? Yeah. Yeah, it sounds kind of broken. I don't know if everyone else has a similar experience or it's just my network. I have no idea. Go, go, go for it. Go for it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you. It's a very interesting discussion. And uh, one of the issues that I'm, I've been thinking lately is about translation and languages, because yeah. uh, obviously this is a, a very um, local uh, discussion, local in the sense of this is happening in English. And uh, how can we, um, you know, um, make things accessible for people who whose language is not English, that's one yeah. thing, it's, but they also choose to speak their own ideas and share in their own language because there are cultures that speak, uh, it has a specific meaning. So that's, that's my, my question on, on how the directions will go on open access and, and, and any, any kind of um, accessibility. You know, we, we're very lucky, Bertha, with our chapters often when I write something or put something up um our, our, it, it might be my Mexican chapter will translate it into Spanish in fact there was I think our strategy was translated by our Turkish chapter you know and it was it was just you know it was in the goodness of people wanting to kind of share that but the issue about translation um there's a couple of things we think about at Creative Commons because I'm just very mindful that my community is global as I say, we've got 48 chapters, people in actually 80 countries who are part of our network and platform work and community. And there's you know, more in terms of, of the broader community. And so we think a lot about, well, what can we do with technology to make translation happen? So that's one thing. How can we be more inclusive in meetings, particularly where English is not the majority first language spoken? So how can we do that more effectively? And I think we've got a lot to do with that. But the translation of our licenses um, in terms of Creative Commons has been both something that's, that was driven by people in local communities, but there's so much more that we've got to do with that. So I think you're absolutely right that language is still too often a barrier. And we need to be mindful of that, particularly because we're thinking about that kind of global reach that we, that, that you know, that we, that many of us look towards. And if we are, just looking at that through the, the prism of the English language, then we lose out. I always say sometimes in, in the United Kingdom, we're, we're prisoners of the English language because so few of us speak fluently another language. And I have to say that when I was in the European Parliament for 20 years, there's something I absolutely miss is hearing other languages spoken. And I'm so privileged to be in an international organization where I do hear other languages and other cultures, and I'm doing that, but you know, just there's something about um, being able to understand and appreciate and value the point you're making, and I totally agree with you. Okay, both. So we have another comment about translation as well. So it's obviously very, um, it's it's important, very important. Um, I, I wondered if you felt like you could make comments. Um, Catherine, because there's a couple, yeah. of, I, I can't follow all of them because of course yeah. they're going into chat and not into questions. Yeah. <laughs> it always does um, because everyone's chatting about the orphan works exception that disappeared, I believe, or is, I do feel like you can comment on that. I think that, um, well, I, we, I've worked on orphan works stuff. Yeah, the European I know, yeah. Um, I mean, my, my stuff in the European part was more to do with platform liability in Article 13 which is the gift that keeps on giving because Article 17 is still not resolved and it still won't be um, resolved. But the, 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 I mean, if I give an example, maybe this is you know helpful, not helpful, but the European um, House of History was doing a kind of the, the most, the 100 most important book, books of the European Union. And only five of them, five out of the 100 could be accessible because they could not find the, cop the, the the owner of the copyright of the others and therefore could not make that accessible yeah. digit i mean yeah. this is and that means the history of the european mm. union mm. is not accessible digitally mm. i mean this is just it, there's something wrong about this and there's something that you know that we can change and I, I was talking to somebody um this was in the space about thinking about controlled digital lending and and and, and these kind of issues but I mean, maybe this is an extreme extreme thought but you know you know, we just passed the, the piece of law in Scotland about organ donation where, you know, if something happens, your, your organs will be automatically, unless you see otherwise. So it's, it's an, you know, 
we that this that should be you know things that are in you know books that we can that should be you know accessible taken as I want to say taken as read but there's something about opting in systems and 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 ways that we can do things differently so that that knowledge is not lost and the worry is that you know we have we, people can publish all the time now but it's hard to be read and we need to have a place where where um where works can be accessible and not just squirreled away and not accessible to to the broader human being humankind so I, I i mean i'm digressing a little bit off but 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 i think that um there's a lot that we need to explore in the uk now that we've left the european union particularly over copyright and what that means in terms of are we following some of the things that we're we were we were to follow because of the European Union and there's some still some questions still some real tensions that have still to be resolved and clarified mm -hmm. and you know my thoughts are that that often those those are opportunities to kind of you know challenge issues and get things but they're also challenges and it takes you know a real unified voice and opinion and coming together to be able to almost a, a campaign on some of these things to ensure that knowledge is is open for us all yeah which is what we we, we kind of have that going on a little, little bit in the yeah. chat we've also got some really nice um shared uh pieces of work that are in the chat which you might want to have a look at at some point Thank probably you. not at the moment um uh cesar has added around trans so translation is a vital process uh, yeah. uh which we which yeah we need as much as possible um uh, i i would if i could uh have um look yes yeah, so Stuart Debster said yes we need a movement <laughs> so there you go <laughs> um I wonder if I could ask the question uh, yes. to chair's prerogative around generational shifts yes. um in terms of uh you know I, I, I'm you know I'm meaning it up until uh up to students um yes. uh, and and you know if, if creative commons is seeing any differences um in the generational in the generations yeah, I, I keep it well. I mean, I'm, I, yeah, I've got two team members who are, are, are about to literally give birth, so I, we always have a little laugh just now that I, I, you know, I ask for a future generation for Creative Commons, and my my team are 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 are, are you know creating a new generation of little people, and this is wonderful. But in terms of how we look at, I, I, you know. Creative Commons was created 20 years ago and we've moved on to today celebrating 20 years. And I do think that all organisations need to think about young people and bringing new people on board. And that is the kind of healthy way. And I think there's a new argument to be made about why open is so important. So 20 years ago, it was failed sharing online, creating an alternative all rights copyright. Today, it's thinking about better sharing. How can we, we do things keeping being open but doing it even more intentionally yeah. Yeah. and i think that's really important and you look also i mean my, my son's 15 my, my 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 youngest son is nine i look at how they consume content and it just you know so, i'll just share with you i mean there was a youtuber i had i i had kind of heard of but but I had a you know he just um he's science he does scientific experiments my, my, my 15 year old really respects him and he did an incredible YouTube video about his autistic son, which was really moving and really moved my 15 year old and and I just and there was something about the power of that, you know, the power of being able to share something to promote understanding to be able to on a very sensitive matter and I thought that that was really that's a powerful example of how you use yeah. a platform to be able to make a difference. Yeah. But then the other side of some of this is that you're kind of like your data, if you're sharing just, stuff on some of these platforms are being sold, yeah, it's selling. Yeah, you know, yeah. we go on to Netflix and an algorithm's yeah. now choosing, bring back Blockbuster. I'm only joking, but I mean, it, but, but, but part of it is like, how are we, you know, my, my kids have only known a digital life and we are an intergenerate, well, I'm an intergeneration of being you know, a digital adapter and kind of moving with things. But I do think that we should take that certainly my son's generation is much more mindful about how they're using technology. It's pretty astute with it compared to, say, maybe an, an older generation who believes some of the stuff that they see in Facebook. So there's 
there's there's I think there's hope with a new generation about thinking about content, about thinking about um, what's important and being a little bit more astute about um, content and how it's created. Does that answer you? I mean, I just I don't have a pivot. I'm just no, gonna... I think you're saying exactly what I was thinking. I just think it's a key. There is a key point, but we now have someone else who's joined us. Max, I think you can do you want to introduce yourself. Yeah, you can take your. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Max Ward. I'm uh, based in London. I, um, I've been with Creative Commons for a very long time. I'm um, one of the founding members of the um, Creative Commons UK chapter um, as well. So, um, and, but I had uh, one of the other hats I wear is I'm an adjunct lecturer and I also do some research supervision at a university here in London, and um, I wanted to bring up sort of the other, one other question around ethics and um, sharing and, and open um, and openness within the education and research context. And that is that um, every time I try to, you know, every time I'm pushing, sort of trying to push the envelope in terms of the introduction of open practices mm -hmm. um, within the within my institution, mm -hmm. and, and this is, I would I would say it's not just my institution. I've had very similar conversations with uh, researchers and academics. Um, yeah across borders uh, everywhere. Um, the issue of um, the ethics of what's known as academic misconduct always comes up in the context of open. And I think, you know, the, 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 the issue of really redefining what it means, sort of moving away from a pure citation based to more of a, and, you know, thinking about the role of attribution, especially in the context of creating derivative works yeah. or, um, you know, partial copying, if you like, um, of openly licensed material and the fact that within the pure research academic construct at the moment, there really isn't any um, acceptance of that. Um, so I was just wondering if that's something that um, Creative Commons, I mean, I think this is kind of actually both to RLUK as well as Creative Commons um, as, a, as a question. Um, so it might not be, you know, something that you can obviously um, talk to directly in the context of, of what Creative Commons as an organization is looking at doing, but just, I'd be just really interested in hearing um, your thoughts on, on this in general and whether you, know, you have any ideas or um, approaches that you think might help move the needle on, on, in this conversation. I, th I think that sometimes um, what we are conscious about is to ensure the, the best application and attribution of, our, of when people are using the licenses and how we can do that better and more effectively. Um, and make it easier. And I think that keeps coming back to us about how can we simplify? How can we make sure that we're doing this in the best way? That doesn't address your question about the perception around academic misconduct. That's, I think that's a, a bigger, but, but I think whenever there's something that's a change, so trying to do something more openly, have, applying the licenses to is, is, is something that now is, is part and parcel of, of a, whether you've got a grant, you've got money to do so, you know, if you're going to put your research up, you have to do it in a CC license, you have to do it effectively, you have to do it in the, the correct way. I, I think if you do it in the correct way and do it effectively, then this idea that somehow there's a hesitation, somehow, so it's, it is about the learning experience of applying the licenses effectively, as well as showing how having that, that information out there reachable and accessible to more to build on that knowledge and accessibility is surely where we are in terms of trying to have knowledge build on knowledge and create a better world that we all want to see but i think that some of our some people who are not for that change and want to resist it it would be very easy i would think to talk about misconduct or use certain things to kind of you know so there's i think there's a job of work actually possibly around pub, a, a, a kind of public relations facing part about saying why this is important, how to do things. And, and we're certainly thinking about how we can always improve in the licenses and make them more easy to use. And, um, and, and you know, that's something we're, we're very conscious about because of our, our responsibility for stewardship. I think um, it, what, what you're saying, Max, resonates with me and Annette has put something in the, in the, in the chat about the positive response from research students making theses openly available using CC licences. And it, it is that, it's that approach, that, that positive approach um, 
uh, that that is helpful. And we've certainly seen, uh, in, uh, you know, early career researchers have their own challenges, but certainly around the creation of theses um, and how they're put together and an understanding about content and what can be licensed and what can't be licensed is a, is a really positive way of working with Creative Commons in higher education. Um, but it's tricky. It and it's and it's and it's difficult and um it's something that we are challenged by every single day um advocacy around openness but it's really nice to talk about it yeah it's not in relation to compliance <laughs> <laughs> I have to say. is that all right max yes thanks yeah uh, Thank as you, you said i mean it is i don't think there is a simple answer to this but oh. it is it is a conversation that uh, i look forward to sort of yeah, seeing grow and become more prominent within uh, within academia generally. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. Thanks very, thanks very much. I've got a question that might lead on quite nicely, Catherine, because I think we've got a few minutes from, um, uh, which is how can we best contribute to stewardship of a public commons? Can we invest better in collective non for profit approaches? Yes, <laughs> big one. Um, I keep, you know, it's funny because. Um, just a, a, a share with you. I mean, I'm, I, I see. I live in Dunfermline, where we've got, um, you know, Better World Books that, you know, that the, the, the Internet Archive. They donate to the Internet Archive. It's, you know, it's down the, the road from me. And then you've got Amazon Warehouse, you know, about a mile away from me. And then you've got, you know, Carnegie who gave to the people of Dunfermline a park, a commons, a, a public commons that is there with us today in terms of how he used his philanthropy for public good. And then you think about the virtual commons and you think about the public domain, what is ours, what is to be built on, what is, and how precious that is. So just as Carnegie did all those years ago, giving us a physical commons that we still benefit from today, how are we going to make sure that the, the public domain that is, belongs to us all and is so integral into the, the lives that we lead because we need it because it's digital, how are we going? So there's some really interesting work being done by Ellie Parser, who is looking at that in New York. And it's like, um, is it Civic Signals? It, they're doing some really, and um, it, 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 the, uh, <coughs> the professor at um, uh, U, UMass um, Amherst to um, Ethan Zuckerman, who's doing also really interesting work in that kind of space. And I do think there's something about, look, you know, John Muir, sorry, I'm feeling very Scottish when I'm talking to him. I'm really sorry. I'm like, you know, no. John Muir at the national parks, going to America, making the first national parks, and then we've got our national parks and we've expanded those national parks. There's something about, you know, like that, that that is ours and it's our space and it's it's ours to protect. And it's not protected at the moment. The public domain is under pressure. And I keep coming back to thinking about a campaign to A, promote the public domain, but also think about how we build upon, preserve, work on it. You know, like there, there, there has to be something in the next few years that we really take on board with this, and um, and 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 really, it's 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 for for you know for all of us to do because going back to that generative versus proprietary stuff. I mean, the generative internet that that was the basis of what we thought would be, and now we mm. see all these proprietary systems that were built upon the generative internet and now they're protecting their interests. And so there's something that we have to do um, and, and think constructively how we work together to achieve, a, a, a achieve this um, goal. Okay. I think that is a really nice point. I know you had a final slide, Catherine. Oh, yeah, Do you feel sure. like you want to, to, to finish us with that sure. final slide? Would that be sure, sure. So it was just a little bit about kind of how you could get involved with Creative Commons. Many of you already are, but it's just, you know, in terms of that um, idea around better open sharing and what we can do, thank you so much for those ideas and contributions. Greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, please come and join our community. We've got um, the education, copyright and GLAM platforms. We are being developing our advocacy, license innovation and capacity, build, capacity, capacity building with <laughs> our new strategy. We've also got the CC certificates, which we call CC certs and the boot camps. We've got um, CC certs in education and in, in for librarians. And we're developing a new CC cert for, for just the glam sector itself. So that's quite exciting for us. 
Um, we had a webinar last month about, you know, a year of COVID and kind of what openness meant. That was really, we, we had such success with that. And the Open Minds podcast, I draw your attention to this because it's just, if you're interested in this space and about about the open ecosystem. As I said, we had Coraline talking about eth ethical licenses. We had Leela Bailey from the, the Internet Archive talking about the challenges, the thinking about archives, that, what, what are the challenges that we're going to face with all of this? And we've just interviewed Audrey Tang, who's the digital minister in Taiwan, who's just wonderful about open data and the importance of openness and what they've been doing in Taiwan. And so, um, you know, I just draw your attention to that. And then summit is in the 20th, 24th of September. Um, please just look out for, um, if you fancy uh, making a, a, you know, make a contribution, presenting at summit, please get involved because it'd be just lovely to, lovely to have you there. But look, I just wanted to say, and I think my last, very last slide, here's, you know, my email address. That's my Twitter stuff. And do, you want to my do you want to share that with the, with the, on, on the screen so we can see yeah, it? So sure. got Sorry, it, if they need it. Oh, I realise I'm off the... No, you're all right. Now. You got it. I'll tell you if it comes up. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. There we go. Yeah, it's just coming it's up. Cool. There you go. 